If you follow a lot of crime news, you'll quickly understand that orchestrating a successful heist involves a multitude of factors. Generally, those who impulsively target banks with a reckless approach are swiftly apprehended and seldom reap substantial financial gains. Consequently, individuals capable of executing the perfect heists of monumental proportions tend to possess exceptional intelligence. In this video, we are going to be showing you unique kinds of thieves. Thieves so smart, they successfully stole more than $3 billion in 30 minutes. Jimmy Jong. For nearly a decade, it was one of the biggest mysteries in crypto. Who stole 50,000 bitcoins, which would ultimately be worth more than $3 billion, from a dark website called the Silk Road? No one knew until the man behind the crime made a costly mistake. It was a story that seemed straight out of a Hollywood movie, a tale of a young man who went from obscurity to becoming a secret Bitcoin billionaire. James Jimmy Jong, a former computer science major and Bitcoin enthusiast, had a life that most could only dream of. Private jets, wild parties, and a dark secret that would eventually catch up with him. This is the story of one of the smartest thieves in history, who managed to rob over $3 billion worth of Bitcoin in just 30 minutes. Jimmy Jong lived a life without limits. With his newfound wealth, he embraced a party monster lifestyle that left those around him in awe. But how did he come to possess such unimaginable wealth? To understand the full story, we have to go back to the earliest days of Bitcoin itself. Zhong was involved in the early development of Bitcoin, a revolutionary digital currency that promised to change the world. But as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And for Zhong, that responsibility took a dark turn. It was during his involvement with Bitcoin that Zhong stumbled upon an error on the infamous online black market Silk Road. This error allowed him to withdraw more funds than what was initially deposited. It was a flaw that would become the key to his massive heist. Zhong exploited this flaw to its fullest extent. He managed to steal over 51,680 bitcoins from Silk Road between 2012 and 2014. But what made Zhong truly remarkable was his ability to conceal his identity and elude detection for nearly a decade. Zhong was no ordinary thief. He was a master of deception, using tools tools like cryptocurrency mixers to obscure the origin of the stolen bitcoins. This made it nearly impossible for anyone to trace the funds back to him. To the outside world, he appeared to be just another successful early bitcoin adopter, mining thousands of bitcoins in the technology's early days. With his ill-gotten gains, Zhong lived a life of luxury. He owned multiple properties, including a bungalow in Athens and a stunning home on Lake Lanier. Expensive cars, a boat, and even a private jet became part of his extravagant lifestyle. He spared no expense when it came to his friends, often buying drinks and shots for everyone at the bars, leaving them in awe of his generosity. Stefano Masic, a friend who met Zhong while studying at the University of Georgia, recalls his generosity. He would buy me and my friends drinks, and then there were multiple times too, where he would buy shots for everyone at the bars. He would buy shots for every single person in the bar. It was like he had an endless supply of money. Zhong's parties became legendary, with his friends enjoying the high life alongside him. In 2018, when his beloved Georgia Bulldogs made it to the Rose Bowl, Zhong spared no expense. He rented a private jet, booked a luxurious Airbnb in Los Angeles, and even gave each of his friends a budget to splurge on Rodeo Drive. We all flew private, and Jimmy rented a really nice Airbnb. He got everyone really nice tickets to the game too. He ended up giving everyone a budget, and that was very unexpected. Just having a friend who would give all his friends money to purchase items on Rodeo Drive, it was like a dream. In 2019, Zhong made a small mistake that would prove to be his undoing. He transferred a small amount of the stock stolen bitcoins to a cryptocurrency exchange that followed strict know-your-customer rules. This caught the attention of the IRS's Criminal Investigation Division, who began to dig deeper into his activities. On November 9, 2021, a raid on Zhong's Gainesville, Georgia home resulted in the seizure of about 50,176 bitcoins. Zhong, realizing the game was up, cooperated with investigators, forfeiting all of his bitcoins and pleading guilty to one count of wire fraud. In 2023, Zhong was sentenced to a year and a day in prison, bringing an end to his reign as one of the smartest thieves in history. Bangladesh Bank Robbery Million, 30 million, all in US dollars, 19 million and 25 million. Um, did this not raise an alarm? 
In February 2016, the world witnessed one of the most audacious cyber heists in history. The thieves knew that timing was everything, and they struck when the bank's offices were closed for the weekend. With the bank seemingly quiet and secure, they began their meticulously planned operation. The first step for these smart thieves was to compromise the bank's computer network. They infiltrated the system, leaving no trace of their presence. Once inside, they gained access to the bank's credentials for payment transfers, the keys to the kingdom. Using these credentials, the thieves were now ready to execute their fraudulent instructions. They used the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, or SWIFT, network to communicate with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the custodian of Bangladesh Bank's foreign exchange account. The hackers issued a total of 35 fraudulent instructions, each one carefully crafted to transfer funds from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York account to accounts in the Philippines and Sri Lanka. But little did they know that their plan was about to hit a major roadblock. The banking system flagged 30 of the transactions, raising suspicions due to a misspelled instruction. It was a small mistake, but it would prove to be their downfall. The remaining five requests, however, slipped through the cracks, successfully transferring a staggering $101 million. Out of the $101 million, $81 million was traced to the Philippines. The thieves had deposited the money into five separate accounts with the Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation, using fictitious identities to cover their tracks. But they weren't done yet. The stolen funds were then cleverly transferred to a foreign exchange broker who converted the money into Philippine pesos. Finally, the ill-gotten gains were consolidated in the account of a Chinese-Filipino businessman, leaving investigators baffled by the intricate web of deception. Meanwhile, the remaining $20 million was intended for Sri Lanka. However, a simple misspelling in the request raised suspicions at Deutsche Bank. The hackers had intended the funds to go to the Shalika Foundation, but the misspelling of foundation as foundation caught the attention of the bank's security systems. This misspelling triggered an investigation, and the transaction was ultimately blocked. It was a stroke of luck for the authorities, as it provided a crucial lead in unraveling the mystery behind this audacious heist. As news of the Bangladesh bank robbery spread, everyone was surprised. How could such a massive theft occur right under the noses of the banking system? The answer lay in the sophisticated malware that had been installed within the bank's system in January 2016. This malware allowed the hackers to gather vital information on the bank's operational procedures for international payments and fund transfers. It was a chilling reminder that even the most secure systems could be breached by those with enough determination and expertise. The investigation into the Bangladesh bank robbery involved multiple countries, including Bangladesh, the Philippines, and the United States. The FBI suspected that at least one bank employee acted as an accomplice, and there were even possible links between the theft and the government of North Korea. Security companies claimed that the Lazarus Group, a notorious North Korea-based hacking collective, was likely behind the attack. The scale and sophistication of the operation pointed to their involvement, but concrete evidence was hard to come by. As the investigation unfolded, the response from linked organizations was swift. The Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation, RCBC, denied any involvement in money laundering and fully cooperated with the authorities. However, the president of RCBC ultimately resigned, taking moral responsibility for the incident. Similarly, the governor of Bangladesh Bank also resigned amid the ongoing investigation, highlighting the gravity of the situation and the need for accountability. Antwerp Diamond Heist it all began in the summer of 2001 when Leonardo Notabatolo, a seasoned jewel thief, set his sights on the Antwerp Diamond Center. Located in the heart of the Antwerp Diamond District, this building housed some of the world's most valuable diamonds, gold, and jewelry. With billions of dollars worth of precious gems passing through its doors every day, it was a thief's paradise. Notabatolo rented a small office within the Diamond Center, posing as a gem importer from Turin, Italy. This allowed him to gain access to the inner workings of the building and observe the security measures in place. Over the course of 18 months, he meticulously studied the layout, the security systems, and the routines of the diamond dealers. Notabatolo knew that to successfully execute this heist, he needed to overcome multiple layers of security. The Antwerp Diamond Center boasted an impressive array of safeguards, including infrared heat detectors, Doppler radar, a magnetic field, a seismic sensor, and a lock with 100 million possible combinations. But Notabatolo was determined to outsmart them all. To achieve this, Notabatolo and his team 
team employed innovative methods and cutting-edge technology. They disabled the security cameras, rendering them useless to the guards monitoring the premises. They also blinded the heat and light sensors, ensuring that their movements would go undetected. But perhaps the most impressive feat of their planning was the creation of a replica vault. Nota Bartolo knew that to crack the complex lock system, they needed practice. So they painstakingly recreated the vault, studying its mechanisms and practicing their techniques until they were confident in their ability to bypass the security measures. With their preparations complete, the day of the heist finally arrived. It was a clear, frozen Sunday evening in February 2003. Notar Bartolo, accompanied by his childhood friend and accomplice, Speedy, set off on their mission. A day before, Notar Bartolo had visited posing as a routine visit. While there, he was able to disarm the thermal motion sensors with women's hairspray. The security camera actually caught him do that. The guard knew about his visit so they did not think twice about what he was up to. During the robbery, the Notar Bartolo stayed in a nearby getaway vehicle, listening to the police scanner. The entire team wore plastic gloves and got access to the building via a shared private garden that was not under video surveillance. Through the garden, they were able to access a small balcony on the diamond center. They then circumvented the infrared sensors with a polyester shield and disabled the alarm on the balcony window. They got access to the vault with a replica key. Then, an individual in the team called the Monster, having worked in darkness and memorized the steps inside the vault from the replica, was able to access the jewelry boxes. The men were able to get away with their heist until Nota Bartolo and Speedy tried to dispose of the evidence of their plan. It was at this point that the police caught them. Nota Bartolo, however, remained tight-lipped about his accomplices, leaving the police to piece together the full story. Despite his denial of involvement, the circumstantial evidence was strong enough to secure his conviction. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his role in the heist. Despite extensive efforts, the majority of the stolen diamonds have never been recovered. The thieves had managed to evade capture with their precious loot, leaving investigators and the diamond industry baffled. The missing diamonds became the subject of speculation and intrigue, captivating the world's attention. The Antwerp diamond heist became known as one of the most audacious and intriguing robberies in history. Books, documentaries, and podcasts were dedicated to unraveling the mystery and exploring the ingenuity of the thieves. The story fascinated people from all walks of life, from diamond enthusiasts to true crime aficionados. Carbonac Hacking Group in recent years, the world has witnessed an alarming rise in cybercrime, but nothing could have prepared us for the audacity and sophistication of the Carbonac Hacking Group. Led by a group of highly skilled hackers, this criminal organization has targeted banks, e-payment systems, and financial institutions in approximately 30 countries since 2013. What sets them apart is their unique approach. Instead of targeting individual end users, they directly attack the banks themselves, making them the ultimate thieves. The story of the Carbonac Hacking Group began when Sergei got Lovanov, principal security researcher at Kaspersky Lab's global research and analysis team, was shown a video of a criminal taking money from an ATM without even touching the machine. Intrigued, Golovanov and his colleagues embarked on a mission to uncover the truth behind this incredible feat. Their investigation led them to discover the Carburp and Anunak malware code, which eventually led them to the Carbonac malware. This malicious code provided the trail which the team followed to find Carbonac malware in a Moscow-based bank's internal networks. The security Security researchers found that the infection, which began through three spear phishing emails, had remained undetected for two months. In total, they discovered 22 Chinese exploits. This one case provided the chance to connect the dots to other ATM thefts, fraudulent bank transfers, and missing deposits in banks across the world. The discovery of Carbonac united all of the theft cases around the world through one advanced persistent threat, APT, according to Golovanov. Once infected with Carbonac, the malware spread like wildfire across the internal corporate networks of banks. The hackers meticulously tracked down administrator computers and used covert video surveillance programs to record the screens of staff members dealing with cash transfer systems. With this valuable data, the criminals were able to mimic the actions of bank employees and fraudulently transfer cash. Online banking and international payment systems were used to deposit stolen funds into Chinese and US accounts, and it is possible that transfers were also made to bank accounts in other countries. But the Carbonac Hacking Group's criminal activities didn't stop them. There. In other cases, the cyber attackers penetrated right into the very heart of the accounting systems, as Kaspersky Lab explains. The criminals were able to inflate account balances before fraudulently transferring the money. This covert method allowed them to steal funds without alarming the account owners, as only the inflated balance would be transferred away, leaving the original funds in place. But perhaps one of the most shocking tactics employed by the Carbonac hacking group was their ability to compromise ATMs. Through the use of Carbonac, they were able to remotely instruct ATMs 
to dispense cash at specific times. A criminal associate would then be waiting to collect the cash, completing the heist. This method allowed them to steal large sums of money directly from the banks themselves. It is estimated that by hacking into banks, the cyber criminals were able to make off with approximately $1 billion over 24 months. The largest amounts were stolen by breaking into banks directly and stealing up to $10 million in each raid, according to security experts. On average, each robbery took between two and four months to complete, from the initial infection to the final theft. The Carbonac Hacking Group's criminal activities have had a global impact. Their primary targets were in Russia, followed by the United States, Germany, China, and Ukraine. However, their reach extended far beyond these countries, with banks in the US, UK, Australia, Canada, and Hong Kong also falling victim to their sophisticated cyber attacks. To this day, the Carbonac Hacking Group remains active, posing a significant threat to the global financial sector. The Central Bank of Iraq Robbery Moving on from cybercrimes, the central bank robbery in Iraq in 2023 implicated one of the most prominent figures in the country, Saddam Hussein. In the early hours of March 18, 2003, the Central Bank of Iraq became the stage for one of the most audacious heists in history. Led by Qusay Hussein, the son of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, a team of Iraqi regime officials orchestrated the forced withdrawal of a staggering $1 billion from the country's coffers. At first glance, one might assume that the forced withdrawal was undoubtedly illegal. After all, how could such a massive sum of money be taken from a central bank without consequences? However, legal experts have since debated the intricacies of the situation. Saddam Hussein, an absolute dictator, held personal and direct control over every aspect of Iraq's governance, including the central bank and other economic institutions. This raised the possibility that the $1 billion might have been Saddam Hussein's personal funds, amassed over his more than two decades of rule in Iraq. The argument for the legality of the forced withdrawal rests on the notion that Saddam Hussein, as an absolute dictator, had the authority to order the release of funds from the central bank. In his role as the supreme ruler, he had the power to dictate the country's financial affairs. This interpretation suggests that the withdrawal, though extraordinary in its scale, may not have violated any existing laws. However, critics argue that even if Saddam Hussein had the authority to order the withdrawal, the act itself was morally and ethically questionable. The funds in the central bank were meant to serve the Iraqi people to support the country's economy and development. By siphoning off such a massive amount, Saddam Hussein and his regime deprived the nation of much-needed resources, exacerbating the already dire conditions faced by the Iraqi population. The international community, particularly the United States and its allies, viewed the forced withdrawal with suspicion. American intelligence officials initially believed that Qusay Hussein intended to transport the stolen money across the border to evade the impending American invasion. Reports from U.S. Army Special Forces stationed near Iraq Iraq's border with Syria claimed to have witnessed trucks matching the description crossing over the border, fueling speculation about the fund's intended use. Another theory emerged, suggesting that the money would be used to fund resistance efforts within Iraq as American troops advanced throughout the country. Many Iraqis shared this belief as they saw the funds as a means to support the flight of Saddam Hussein's closest associates, including his family and personal friends. The notion that the stolen money could be used to finance the escape of those responsible for the brutal regime regime further fueled public outrage. In the days and weeks following the heist, coalition forces embarked on a mission to recover the stolen funds. Through extensive searches and patrols across the country, they managed to locate an estimated $650 million of the money. These caches of funds were discovered hidden away in one of the palaces utilized by Uday Hussein, Saddam's other son. The recovery of a significant portion of the stolen money provided some solace to the Iraqi people who had suffered under the oppressive regime for years. However, the the fate of the remaining $350 million remains a mystery. Despite exhaustive efforts, coalition forces were unable to locate any trace of the missing funds. The question of what happened to this substantial sum continues to baffle investigators and captivate the public's imagination. After orchestrating the audacious Central Bank of Iraq robbery, Qusay Hussein, the son of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, found himself in a precarious position. The international community was on high alert, and the United States-led invasion of Iraq was imminent. Qusay's actions had drawn attention, and it was only a matter of time before he would face the consequences. As coalition forces closed in on Kusai, he became increasingly desperate to evade capture. Reports indicated that he had taken refuge in a house in the northern Iraqi city of Mosul. American troops, determined to bring him to justice, launched a series of raids on the property in an effort to apprehend him. Kusai, however, was not prepared to surrender without a fight. He and his brother Uday, both wanted by the coalition forces, were determined to resist capture at all costs 
costs. The house in Mosul became a battleground as American forces encountered fierce resistance from the Hussein brothers and their loyalists. Numerous raids were conducted on the house, with American troops facing a barrage of gunfire and explosives. The situation escalated to the point where American forces resorted to using Tau anti-tank missiles, firing a total of 12 missiles into the house. The intense firepower was unleashed in an attempt to neutralize the threat posed by Kusai and Uday. In the end, the two brothers met their demise beneath the debris of their house. 300 million yen robbery. On the morning of December 10, 1968, four employees from the Kokubunji branch of Nihon Shintaku Ginko were in the process of transporting 294,307,500 yen stored in metal boxes in the trunk of a Nissan Cedric company car. These funds were intended as bonuses for the Toshiba Fuchu factory employees. A young man, dressed in the uniform of a motorcycle police officer, intercepted the car's path a mere 200 meters away from its destination, on a street adjacent to Tokyo Fuchu Prison, presenting himself as a police officer, he lied to the bank employees, claiming that their branch manager's residence had been destroyed by an explosion. He further stated that a warning had been received about an explosive device being planted in the car. Following the instructions, the four employees exited the vehicle. The imposter police officer then proceeded to crawl under the car. Shortly afterward, he emerged, warning that the car was on the brink of exploding, accompanied by the appearance of smoke and flames underneath it. As the employees retreated, the fake police officer took advantage of the situation, swiftly getting into the car and making a getaway. Within minutes of receiving the report about the robbery, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department sprang into action. A state of emergency was declared throughout Tokyo. Checkpoints were swiftly set up at every intersection in the city, creating a massive dragnet to catch the elusive culprit. At these checkpoints, officers meticulously inspected every vehicle that passed by, hoping to find any trace of the thief or the stolen money. However, despite their best efforts, they were not able to catch anyone. A short while after the robbery, the police made a startling discovery. The thief had driven the bank car to a second location where he switched to another vehicle. He repeated this process once more, leaving behind a trail of abandoned cars covered with canvas car covers. With three separate crime scenes to process, each containing a significant amount of physical evidence, the authorities faced a daunting task. They meticulously collected and analyzed every item, hoping to find a clue that would lead them closer to the identity of the thief. The sheer volume of evidence left behind by the meticulous thief was staggering. The police found themselves sifting through 120 pieces of evidence, including the police motorcycle that had been painted white. However, upon closer examination, it became clear that these items were intentionally placed to confuse the investigation. The police launched an unprecedented effort to gather information. They posted 780,000 montage pictures throughout Japan, featuring possible suspects and individuals who matched the description of the thief. This massive undertaking involved the participation of 170,000 policemen, making it the largest investigation in Japanese history. The authorities authorities hoped that this extensive public outreach would yield valuable leads and help them narrow down the list of suspects. The nation was on high alert, and everyone was eager to assist in bringing the thief to justice. However, as the investigation progressed, a prime suspect emerged. A 19-year-old man, the son of a police officer, became the focus of the authorities' attention. He had no alibi and had shown a keen interest in the case prior to the robbery. Before the police could question him, tragedy struck. The young man died of potassium cyanide poison poisoning on December 15, 1968. Although the money was not found at the time of his death, his demise was deemed a suicide, and he was considered not guilty according to official records. Despite this setback, the investigation pressed on. Fingerprint specialist Uhei Tsukamoto dedicated himself to solving the case, determined to uncover the truth. His expertise and relentless pursuit of justice led him to uncover new leads and potential connections. However, after seven years of tireless investigation, the police announced in December 1975 that the statute of limitations on the crime had passed. Even to this day, the 300 million yen robbery remains unsolved. The thief, relieved of any civil liabilities, has the freedom to tell his story without fear of legal repercussions. Heist of the Century in the summer of 2021, a series of government letters were issued, signed by various institutions, including the Prime Minister's office. These letters cancelled the audit of withdrawals from the Iraqi Tax Commission's accounts, setting the stage for the embezzlement of tax revenues. The theft of $2.5 billion was apparently facilitated by shell companies with almost no paper trail, thanks to the help of corrupt officials. But how did this heist unfold? How were billions of dollars stolen without leaving a trace? According to an internal investigation's 41 
one-page report seen by The Guardian, the stolen tax money was withdrawn by shell companies with almost no paper trail. This was made possible with the help of corrupt officials who were part of a well-connected network. To further conceal their tracks, the stolen funds were laundered through real estate purchases in Baghdad's most affluent neighborhood. Multiple sources have confirmed that the scheme was allegedly masterminded by a well-connected businessman, while employees within the tax commission executed the plan. These employees enjoyed the support of an Iran-aligned political faction called Bada, adding another layer of complexity to this shocking heist. But a heist of such proportions could only have occurred with the knowledge and involvement of a wider range of institutions. Leaked documents and interviews with officials, business people, and bankers with detailed knowledge of the case reveal that the Prime Minister's office, the bank that cleared the withdrawals, the Integrity Commission, and the Central Bank all played a role in this massive theft. It's a big network, and behind it are big politicians from powerful entities leading the country. Heads of departments cannot steal such amounts alone, said a former member of the Parliament's Finance Committee. This shocking revelation highlights the extent of corruption within Iraq's government and the collusion among those in power. The scandal was finally made public by the outgoing government, but it was overshadowed by mutual accusations between rival Shia factions. Corruption investigations in Iraq are often used to discredit opponents rather than promote transparency. Graft is deeply ingrained in the country's consociational democracy, where government positions are divided between parties to ensure everyone gets a share of the pie to fuel their patronage networks. Dresden's Royal Palace Heist the Green Vault Museum, also known as Grunus Gewölbe, holds a storied history that dates back to 1723. It was established by Augustus II the Strong, Elector of Saxony and King of Poland, a man renowned for his extravagant and luxurious tastes. This opulent museum, located within Dresden Castle in Saxony, Germany, quickly became a symbol of wealth and cultural prestige. At the time of the heist, the Green Vault housed an astonishing collection of over 4,000 items of jewelry and other treasures. These artifacts were meticulous meticulously crafted and adorned with gold, silver, ivory, pearl, and an array of precious metals and stones. Each piece was a testament to the exquisite craftsmanship of the era. One of the crown jewels of the Green Vault was the renowned Dresden Green Diamond. This remarkable gem, weighing 41 carats, captivated visitors with its vibrant green hue and flawless clarity. However, at the time of the heist, this magnificent diamond was on loan to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, leaving the other treasures vulnerable to the audacious thieves. The Green Vault's significance extended far beyond its opulent displays. It was a testament to the rich history and cultural heritage of Saxony. The museum's eight rooms, each more breathtaking than the last, stood as a testament to the region's past glories and the grandeur of its rulers. The treasures within the Green Vault were not just valuable possessions, they were a part of Saxony's identity. On the fateful morning of November 25, 2019, darkness descended upon the Green Vault Museum. At 4 a.m., a small fire was deliberately ignited on the nearby Augustus Bridge bridge, causing a power box to be destroyed. Streetlights flickered off and security alarms fell silent. The stage was set for an audacious crime that would shock the world. The thieves then made their move in the dark. They skillfully cut through the iron bars surrounding a window, gaining access to the museum's jewel room. CCTV footage captured their every move, revealing their small stature as they squeezed through the narrow opening. These were individuals who had meticulously planned their entry into the heart of the green vault. Once inside, the thieves were greeted by a breath taking display of opulence. Armed with an axe, they fearlessly smashed the glass displays between them and the priceless treasures. Their actions were swift and calculated as they targeted three 18th century jewelry sets, each consisting of 37 parts adorned with diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. However, not all the pieces from the jewelry sets were taken. Some of the jewelry had been sewn into the surface of the cabinets, making it impossible for the thieves to remove them. Nevertheless, they managed to escape with an array of astonishingly valuable items. Among the stolen treasures was the Dresden White Diamond, a dazzling gem estimated to be worth nine to ten million dollars. This exquisite diamond, with its flawless beauty, was now in the hands of the audacious thieves, but their greed did not stop there. The thieves also made off with the diamond-laden breast star of the Polish Order of the White Eagle, a symbol of royal prestige that once belonged to the King of Poland. A hat clasp, boasting a 16-carat diamond, and a diamond epaulette were also among the stolen items. Perhaps 
Perhaps the most striking of all was a small sword, an epée made of silver and gold, its hilt adorned with nine large diamonds and an astonishing 770 smaller diamonds. As the thieves made their escape through the same window they had entered, they took the time to replace the iron bars, hoping to delay detection. Little did they know that their every move was being closely monitored. At 4.56 a.m., just minutes after the thieves had fled, the robbery was discovered by vigilant guards. The alarm was raised, and within moments, 16 police cars were dispatched to the scene. However, the thieves had already vanished into the night. That brings us to the end of this video. Do you think these guys are really smart? Please let us know in the comments. And hey, if you liked this video, click on the cards on your screen for more.